Chief Provost and Vice President for Equity and Diversity at Eastern. If I read his entire biography, you would be listening to me instead of Dr. Close. But just a few highlights. He was born in Georgia. Um, he has taught courses that focus on African American, American, African, church, and Southern history. He has been a panelist on the Smithsonian Channel panel and NPR. He's received an award for excellence from NCAA Faculty and Athletic Representatives. He has published numerous books and articles, including one on African Americans in Connecticut. He's also in NAACP's 100 Most Influential Blacks in Connecticut. Eastern Connecticut State University's Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., Distinguished Service Award, and in the current Hartford Currents magazine's 12 hot professors. <laughs> so, Dr. Close. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. And thank you, Steve. And also, I want to thank uh, UConn CLIR for the invitation to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, Dr. King and the um, power of education and message for the moment. Uh, and uh, before I go, I'll talk a little bit about the hot professor. Thing as well, uh, Kathy, because um, uh, I got that award back in 1999. It, the the meaning of hot back then is not quite like what it is now. Um, although my wife is still okay with me, but it it's different now than what it what it meant back in 1999. Uh, so I always like to to make that make that make that clear. But let me share my screen with you and talk to you just a little bit. Uh, about the uh, the topic for today, and we'll move from there. So let me um, get my slideshow from the beginning. So, um, in, in in talking about Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the power of education and his message uh, for the moment, uh, what I wanted to do was to talk about how education not only shaped his early life but how it began to impact him, particularly in college. And then some of the um, connections in New England to this educational development of one of the um, more profound uh, leaders in American history. Uh, and then talk about how young people in particular impacted his own education about what was going on around him. And also uh, what was left with his children. So, uh, as many of you know, Dr. King was a a, a child of the uh, the segregated South. He is the son of Reverend Martin Luther King uh, Sr. Uh, and the family's life was very much dominated by his father and and mother, and everything revolved pretty much around the church. Uh, he was part a, of a um, uh, a family whereby which he and his brother and sister were PKs, preacher's kids. And Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, was their, their landing place on, on Sunday and for many days throughout the week. But the Atlanta that he was born in in 1929 was very much a, a, a segregated society, a society where you could clearly see the demarcation between the black community and the white community. And so Dr. King very much uh, lived a, a, a segregated life. Now, living a segregated life for him meant that not only uh, did his, his life revolve around the church, but it also meant educationally, he was educated in a segregated environment. And he uh, began to clearly understand what that meant in 1941, uh, when he was part of, of the, an oratory contest in Atlanta, Georgia. He won the oratory contest for black students in Atlanta, Georgia, and the state championship was down in Valdosta, Georgia. Um, Valdosta, Georgia now sits right along I-75 um, within the state of Georgia, but back then it was along 
uh, one of the um, major thoroughfares uh, in the in the state of Georgia. So he goes down to 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 Valdosta, Georgia, with his teacher. He wins the oratory contest, and they board the Trailways bus going back to Atlanta. Now, about 90 miles outside of Atlanta, the uh, bus fills up. And segregated buses back then, you sat, if you were black, from the center of the bus backward, and if you were white, from the center of the bus forward. But if you were black and the bus was full and a white person wanted your seat, you had to get up. Well, in 1941, a white person wanted his seat and his teacher's seat. And so they were forced to stand for about 90 miles from Macon to Atlanta, Georgia. And he never forgot the education about segregation and what it meant to him from that, from standing for, for 90 minutes. And I've heard a number of stories about what the ordeal was like uh, even from my, my grandmother, who once stood for three hours on a trailways bus on her way to visit um, one of my aunts when they were students uh, at an HBCU in Atlanta, Georgia in the 60s. So those kinds of things were, were part of his early, early education. It's also a world where his family will encounter people like Alonzo Herndon and his family. Now, Herndon began his career as a barber, but then he moved from there to the insurance industry. He would open Atlanta um, Mutual Life Insurance Company. And it became, for Blacks, at least in terms of education, one of the great meccas in terms of insuring businesses, insuring homes, cars, et cetera. Uh, Herndon was uh, a master at not only fundraising, but also building and supporting black businesses. And he knew Martin's father very well, Reverend Martin King, King Sr. Now, it was also a place of, of violence as well. Uh, Georgia's large black population in Atlanta had suffered through a 1906 race riot out in the hinterlands uh, of Georgia uh, in the 1940s. Uh, there would be the famous Moore's, uh, Moore's Ford lynching uh, that went on in 1946. But for Martin King, as he began to go through school, in 1944, uh, he would travel to Connecticut to work tobacco. Um, he's a 15-year-old by this time, and he's working for the Cullen Brothers tobacco farm out in Simsbury. He learns about the work. He works around the kitchen. He leads prayer meeting and Bible study. And he also gets to, to um, see a world where he can go where he wants to. If he wants to go to the local congregational church for services, he can go. And not his, he's not turned away. If he wants to go to church in Hartford, he, if he wants to go to the state theater, if he wants to go to restaurants in, in Hartford like the cozy spot, nobody stops him. And it will be at the age of 15 that he writes his application for college. He picks as his college uh, of choice Morehouse College. His father had gone there, and he knew a generation of well-known black men who had gone to Morehouse. But Morehouse College was a very special place, and it was a special place because of its professors and the students, and also because of a legendary president by the name of Dr. Benjamin Mays. Dr. Mays was a graduate of Bates, Bates College, and he went on to graduate from the University of Chicago with a uh, degree in philosophy, and then became the president of Morehouse College, probably still their most famous president to, to, this, to this day. But he would set a, set a tone for his students where he was, he was very, very demanding of his students. Uh, as were many of the other professors. And so for a young king, he would encounter professors of the, um, the, the, the ilk of, of Benjamin Mays. And in fact, Mays said of the young king that he liked the fact that he asked questions. And then young king would then turn around and answer his own questions in the classroom. 
But in 1947, uh, King wrote for the um, Morehouse College paper. And in 1947, as an undergrad at Morehouse College, he published in the campus newspaper a short treatise on the purpose of education. He argued that to benefit society, high quality education should focus in on developing students critical thinking and moral compass. Now, that's important in 1947, but it's also important in 2021. In terms of King on education, still a student at the time, he said that intelligence plus character, that is a goal of true education. The complete education gives one not only power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. The broad education will therefore transmit to one not only the accumulated knowledge of the race, but also the accumulated experience of social living. The function of education is to teach one to think intensely and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. He also said as a college student, education must enable one to sift and weigh evidence to discern the true from the false, the real from the unreal, and the facts from the fiction. This is a college student in 1947. And that's why Benjamin Mays found him so interesting, even as a, uh, a, a, a young freshman and sophomore and, and junior. But education is a constant for Martin King and his educational growth is a constant. Now, one of the things he was struggling with um, when he got ready to graduate from Morehouse was what to do. Should it be law school? Should it be medical school? What should it be? Now, many of his friends told him, maybe choose law school. Others told him, why don't you choose to be a college professor? But the idea of what he would do for the rest of his life at least in a sense, was shaped by his father. His father wanted him to be a minister. And like many Morehouse men before him, he chose seminary at Crozier Theological Seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania. And those three years at Crozier would help to shape part of his philosophy of nonviolent social change as a sign sign says here, but not totally. Now, he had heard about uh, Gandhi from a lecture he had heard at Morehouse College by Mordecai Johnson, the president of Howard University in Washington, D.C. But his educational shaping of the philosophy of nonviolence really comes after he decides to pursue a PhD in systematic theology at Boston University. Now, Howard Thurman is a legend as far as black ministers, black theologians, and philosophers go. Not a lot of people know of Howard Thurman, but Howard Thurman uh, had a career um, in religion and in the church in San Francisco. He also was a dean of the chapel at Boston University. And so when King comes to Boston University to study for his PhD, one of the people he depends on a lot, along with his professors, is Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman had roots and ties to Morehouse College and the world of HBCUs. And to a generation of young ministers, he was the guy in terms of theology at the collegiate level. And he would grow over time to adore both Martin as well as Coretta. And a clear example of that, he writes to the Kings, the test of life is often found in the amount of pain we can absorb without spoiling our joy. Uh, he had signed a copy of Deep Rivers and given it to them, but also uh, wrote uh, some words of wisdom for them. It was something that Howard Thurman consistently did. But if you ever want to read something that is magnificent of Howard Thurman, 
uh, take a look at his work on Jesus and the Disinherited. Because that particular work, only a small book, I think it probably no more than uh, 50 or 60 pages or so. But it was something that Dr. King grew to cherish and seemed to carry with him on all of his travels. And in fact, in one of his very first major speeches during the Montgomery bus boycott, he used the ideas that Howard Thurman had shaped from Jesus and the Disinherited in his, in his, in his talk to a church full of people in Montgomery at Dexter. Now, this same Howard Thurman had also visited India, um, not in the uh, 60s, but in the 1940s. He had already visited, and he would visit India several times and actually talk personally with Gandhi. And Gandhi would talk to him about the power of nonviolence. And so that education that Howard Thurman got was then, was then transferred to Dr. King. But along with that, in the educational world of black ministers, there is also the Reverend Dr. Vernon Johns, who was the former pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery before Dr. King got there. Vernon Johns was a treasure trove of knowledge. Uh, he had was born in Virginia, went on to get a degree from Oberlin College in Ohio, the famous Oberlin College, and then he went on to get his, his, his doctorate. But among black ministers, he was revered for his homiletics. He was revered for his ability to deliver sermons that were so profound and to some very prophetic. Well, what most ministers assume, most young black ministers assume was that Vernon Johns had on the ready sermons for any occasion. And so they could go and visit with him, they thought, and get a sermon for almost anything, anything controversial. Because Vernon Johns had preached sermons entitled, It's Safe to Murder Negroes in Montgomery, Alabama. He had preached against the rape of black women in Montgomery, Alabama by, by, by white men, randomly. He also, was said to have turned the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church on its head. The membership was a bit sedity, uh, so he thought they were a little bit stuck up. This mostly black congregation of teachers and lawyers and doctors. So he wanted to shock them by selling vegetables from the pulpit and, and other things. But when Dr. King years later sent one of his subordinates to get a particular sermon from Vernon Johns, the subordinate assumed that Vernon Johns had a copy of it and he could take it somewhere and make a copy. No such copy existed. Vernon Johns had, had memorized hundreds and hundreds of sermons and could repeat them verbatim if you were willing to sit there and transcribe or write down what he was saying. That's how uh, he, he worked. Now, that kind of knowledge was well known within the black community. But it was also a black community struggling with Plessy versus Ferguson, struggling with the Jim Crow system, struggling with the, the, the issues of racism that were permanent, uh, it seemed, in the South. But Charles Hamilton Houston and NAACP attorneys like Thurgood Marshall they would set their sights on slaying the dragon, Plessy versus Ferguson. It will finally be slayed in 1954 because of early groundwork laid by Charles Houston in ending white primaries and allowing blacks to get better education in terms of attorneys. And also uh, because of Thurgood Marshall's skills in the courtroom and Earl Warren being the new Chief Justice in 54, and the court having changed in 54. Plessy versus Ferguson would be overturned. You would get Plessy too in 55, but it would be a number of years before integration would come to the South. And in fact, in the county where I grew up, the first integrated class of students 
uh, didn't enter the first grade together until 1971. Uh, some uh, 17 years after the Brown decision was passed. But changes in the South will also come because of the work of Mecca Evers in Mississippi, talented New Haven lawyer and eventual federal judge, Constance Baker Motley, um, the legendary Jack Greenberg, who after Thurgood Marshall would head up the NAACP legal defense team. They would argue hundreds of cases, both Motley and Greenberg over the years in state court and federal court that would transform a nation legally. It would take some time before full physical transformation would, would occur for huge segments of the South. But when it came to Montgomery, Martin King and his wife Coretta, whom he met in Boston, they would eventually make their way to Montgomery and settle in. Him becoming the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church because they wanted a nice, quiet young minister who would keep them out of the news. And eventually, uh, they would start their family there in Montgomery. But when the Montgomery bus boy comes along, one of the key figures, not the only key figure in the Montgomery bus boycott was the devoted NAACP leader, the devoted NAACP leader uh, that you see in the center. One of the things that you find about the NAACP in 1955 is that in Montgomery, Rosa Parks was a legend among young people. She had educated young people in the NAACP legal defense, legal, excuse me, into the youth council in how to engage in protests nonviolently. She had also studied nonviolence at the Highlander Folk School. And her family was a legend in terms of circles within the black community in Montgomery. She wasn't the first black person to be arrested aboard the bus, not the first black woman. Uh, many people know about Claudette Colvin and other young women who had been arrested aboard the bus. But in 1955, she would prove to be perfect for challenging bus segregation. The leader of the Montgomery Improvement Association was the young Martin King. And they would boycott the buses for more than a year before federal law changed segregation aboard the buses. That change in Montgomery would begin to cause a spiral throughout the rest of the South. And shortly after Montgomery, Martin King would form the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, with a group of ministers. But in the year after the SCLC was formed, he would be attacked while signing copies of his book, A Stride Towards Freedom in New York. And you can see the knife in his chest there and the eventual surgery that it took to save his life um, in, in, 19, in 1958. But out of this struggle in Montgomery, the, the SCLC found allies allies, particularly within the Jewish community. Um, Rabbi Jacob Rothschild in Atlanta, Georgia, became an ally and a friend of Dr. King. But at the same time, he becomes an ally and a friend. He will pay the price, as did Martin King and his family paid the price. In the same year that the King home would be bombed, the, 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 there was also a bombing of Rothschild's temple in Midtown Atlanta by a white supremacist, almost uh, exactly around the same time. But that friendship allowed for the strengthening of a movement where more people were slowly educated about what was happening. Benjamin Mays, um, Rabbi Rothschild, Archbishop Paul Hallinan, and Ralph McGill editor of the Atlanta Constitution, they all became supporters of Martin King's ideas and those of the SCLC. And in fact, 
Uh, they joined together for the first time in Atlanta to have an integrated dinner of thousands when he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 64. Those changes uh, came because slowly but surely, the nation was being educated about what was happening in the South. Now, I mentioned the SCLC, and I mentioned the SCLC because one of the things that people sometimes forget about this organization of ministers was that it would not have been able to be solidified and function without the work of Ella Baker. It was this woman who was the first executive director of an all-male ministerial group. And she put it on solid foundation. And she had been involved in protest work since the 1930s. And she said the focus needed to be voter education. You needed to educate people how to vote. And she also said you needed to be organized and you needed to understand the value of time. Now, that said, the very first meeting she organized, mass voter education meeting she organized for Dr. King to speak, he was late. Very first meeting, he was late. Now, that said, folks, let me ask you, would anyone care to give a guess about how late he was? You can unmute and tell me. An hour? An hour? You are absolutely right. He was an hour late. She walked up to him and said, Dr. King, you're late. And second question to you, what do you think his response was? I he smiled and looked at her. He smiled. And she wondered, how could he be an hour late after they had discussed this over and over again about how important it was that everything start on time and that the church was packed? Well, he understood something that at that particular time that she didn't understand. He understood what he had. And third question for you. Guess what he had? Charisma. He had charisma. He had it. He was an hour late and the church was still packed. And when he walked out, the church just exploded. And you sometimes in life, you run into people who have it. And I'll give you a quick, an ex ex another quick example of the it factor. Um, in 19, I think it was 1974, 70, shortly before the um, Muhammad Ali, George Foreman fight in, in Zaire. And Howard Cosell was telling Muhammad Ali he didn't have it anymore, that he was washed up. He just couldn't do it anymore. And they were riding in this car going down the street in New York. And Cosell was continuing to tell Ali he didn't have it. And legend has it that Ali said, stop the car. In, in the middle of this busy street, in New York, and Ali gets out in the midst of all this traffic and it starts walking down the middle of the street. And shockingly, cars stop and people get out of their car and they start following, talking to Ali. He talks with them, chats them up, walks back to the limo where Howard Cosell is and tells him, you still think I don't have it? and they continue their journey. So that's that it thing. But voter education 
was extremely important uh, because not only was it necessary to vote to change things, but it was also very dangerous. But Ella Baker knew the strategy and she knew that these ministers were key to, to massing people in numbers to, um, to get what they wanted in terms of results. Now, massing them was important, but also understanding the importance of young people. One of the most important educational tools in the country and still in the country are young people. Down in Albany, Georgia in 1962, the young people in Albany, Georgia, they would uh, help to formulate what was called the Albany Movement. They would also join with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee as well. And they would formulate, some of them, a group called the Freedom Singers on the, um, on the left facing you there. Probably the most famous singer of the group is um, Bernice, Bernice Johnson Reagan. Uh, she uh, was the leader of a, of a group called Sweet Honey in the Rock. I think she retired maybe three or four years ago. I heard them several places in Connecticut at um, Connecticut College. I heard them down in New Haven. And I also heard them when they came to the, um, the Jorgensen at the University of Connecticut as well. So one of the things that the young people in Albany do, they are able to not only um, invigorate a movement in Albany that's in decline, but they also bring the music of the movement alive as well. And they also will explain to older leaders some of the new steps that they should take in transforming the nation. When Martin King goes down to Albany, Georgia, he is not necessarily shocked by what he finds, but he finds a, 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 a police chief who is unwilling to engage in confrontation when TV cameras are around. He still arrests people, Laurie Pritchett, but he doesn't engage when TV cameras are around. But it's also these young people who decide to go out to the smaller towns around Albany, Georgia. Now, Albany, Georgia is described by the, uh, the great writer W.E.B. Du Bois in his Souls of Black Folk, and, and the town is also described in his autobiography. Uh, that area around Albany, Georgia during the Civil War was considered to be the breadbasket of the Confederacy. It's also the area near uh, where um, the Andersonville prison is as well. And it's the area where uh, I grew, grew up as a young, youngster as well in decades after uh, the 60s. Well, in, in this area of the nation, you had towns like Dawson, Georgia, that sat in terrible Terrell County. Uh, you had Camilla, Georgia, where you had miserable Mitchell County. And the sheriffs in those areas were known to be very vicious. Church burnings were routine. But when Martin King went down, he saw students who were unwilling to be denied. The students that you see singing here were kicked out of college for participating in the movement by their black college president. Others were forced to leave Albany totally to get all totally total and go to college at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. But their voices would not be muted. On the right is Prathia, Prathia Hall. And Prathia Hall in a small church outside of Albany, Georgia, she said these words. She said, I have a dream. One day, and Dr. King was in the audience and he heard it and he told her, he said, I like what you said about the dream. 
He said, may I use that? I like what you said. Now, that kind of education was what would forever continue the transformation of Martin King. That transformation would, by August of 1963, see the nation ready in terms of those who were willing to protest for a massive march on Washington. The idea wasn't new. A. Philip Randolph had talked about it back in 1941 during World War II. But the, the massive groups, the SCLC, NAACP, SNCC, the National Council of Negro Women, the, um, the, the labor unions in Detroit, uh, like the United Auto Workers, uh, they all contributed to this massive movement of some 250,000 people to Washington, D.C. to protest. On the left is Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin organized this massive protest. But there was a problem for some leaders as far as Bayard Rustin was concerned. The leaders of the National Urban League, Whitney Young, the leader of the NAACP, did not want Bayard Rustin to be part of the movement. And there were two reasons they argued. One, they said he might have ties to the communists. But the more pressing reason why not, they said, was because he was gay. And they thought he needed to be removed as leader of a movement. So they held a meeting. And they decided to vote to oust Bayard Rustin. And they invited Dr. King because they knew in order to remove Bayard Rustin, they needed one vote from him. And that would be it. They could have all voted to keep him, but if Martin King said no, he would be gone. And so most of the people who were asked wanted Rustin gone. Martin King said no. He is my friend. And he has been good for the movement. And I think he should stay. And he stayed. Now, that kind of action, along with Dr. King's keynote address, clearly showed to young people and others in the movement that his voice would not be muted. But it also showed that he was growing in terms of his views as a Baptist minister. Now, growing in his views was one thing. Transforming the nation was another. The March on Washington uh, had been huge, but the Birmingham movement was still going. It was going on uh, even before the, the March on Washington. The two key principal players in the movement that was Birmingham were Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and the Commissioner of Safety, uh, Theopolis Eugene Bull Connor. Bull Connor was a hardcore segregationist and racist. He was considered to be even more powerful than the mayor of Birmingham. And most people were afraid of him, except Fred Shuttlesworth. Fred Shuttlesworth was beaten down by Bull Connor's police for trying to take his daughters to integrate a school. His house was bombed. He was almost murdered, but he refused to give in. And he told Dr. King that Birmingham could change America if you had a mass protest in Birmingham. The mass protest began sometime in March. The mass protests, many of them, the meetings were held at the 16th Street Baptist Church uh, in Birmingham. But before that and after that, there were bombings. But there's also an opportunity for Dr. King to educate a group of ministers. A group of white ministers began to argue 
that the protests in Birmingham were moving too quickly, that they were just too fast, and that you needed to wait and allow for a cooling off period. While jail for protest, he would take an old newspaper and write along the edges his famous letter from the Birmingham jail, explaining why black people couldn't wait anymore. And one of the strongest reasons as to why he said black people couldn't wait anymore, he said blacks had already waited hundreds and hundreds of years already. But one of the more poignant points he puts in his letter is that he had to tell his young daughter she couldn't go to Funtown, uh, an amusement park that I, I think was probably similar in some ways to Six Flags down the road in Agawam, simply because she was black. And he said that pained him to have to tell her that because the commercial for Funtown came on almost daily. And she saw the other children happy and she wanted to go. But he had to, had to explain to her that she couldn't go because she was black. And it, it pained him. But he educated ministers of the gospel on why it was necessary to protest. Now, that necessary protest came with a cost. It came with violence against college students. It came with violence even against children as young as eight, nine, and 10. And it also came with a bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church that saw the deaths of four, four girls, of Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley, all who were simply in Sunday school at 16th Street. And the injury, not often told, serious injuries of some 30 or more people who were at Sunday school uh, that day on September 15, 1963. Now, out of the Birmingham movement, Fred Shuttlesworth was right. The country got the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And they also got congressional support for the Civil Rights Act as well. And that support was spearheaded and clearly spearheaded by one Lyndon Baines Johnson. Lyndon Johnson was a power in politics. Uh, he had been, as far as he was concerned, uh, a hero worshiper of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But it was also Lyndon Johnson who knew how to get things done in politics. Now, get this. Lyndon Johnson was very good friends with Georgia Senator Richard Russell. Richard Russell was a major power player in politics, and he was also a good friend of Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson said to Richard Russell, I need your support on the Civil Rights Act of 64. Richard Russell told Lyndon Johnson he wasn't going to get it. Lyndon Johnson said to him, if I don't get your support, I'm going to run you over. He meant run him over politically. And Lyndon Johnson got the Civil Rights Act passed. It was passed primarily by Republicans in the North, Democrats in the North as well. Very few Southerners, Southern politicians voted for the Civil Rights Act and neither would, would uh, Southern Democrats vote for the Voting Rights Act. But Lyndon Johnson with Votes in Congress and also protest uh, and supporters of the, of the measure in the streets got it passed. But one of the things that came out of Birmingham was a call for a Voting Rights Act. That Voting Rights Act also came with Selma in 1965. Selma was an ecumenical movement that saw not only Baptist ministers and Methodist ministers, but also Catholics, as well as uh, people from the Jewish community taking part in the protest. 
And on the right, uh, you can see nuns who are part of the protests, along with um, a former former um, uh, a former congressman uh, who recently recently passed, and Dr. King, as well as uh, Rabbi Abraham Heschel, as well. So you have John Lewis, you have nuns from portions of New York and Chicago, you have Dr. King, you have Rabbi Heschel, who are all part of this ecumenical movement, a movement that saw the beating um, of protesters in Selma, uh, right before the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And in terms of what happens in 65, 65 also sees vicious loss of life with um, people like Viola Luizzo, and before that, Jimmy Lee Jackson. And one of the people who's in the car with Miss Luizzo when she is murdered is a young man she is transporting by the name of Leroy Moton. Moton survived by pretending that he was dead or else the Klansman who had shot Mr. Weasel would have shot him, shot him dead as well. He would survive the shooting unscathed and flee for his life to Hartford, Connecticut. And there in Hartford, he would educate young people about what was happening down in Alabama. But changes were coming nationwide. Changes that would affect Dr. King in particular. In 1966, Stokely Carmichael uttered the words black power. They were not new. They had been said by Adam Clayton Powell. Uh, they had been said by Marcus Garvey in the 20s. Uh, they had been said by Richard Wright in the 1940s. But SNCC radicalism called for not for nonviolence and turn the other cheek, but for self-defense. Carmichael loved the writings of Malcolm X. And he had watched as the Civil Rights Act of 64 had passed. He had watched as the 65 Voting Rights Act had passed and still violence continued against blacks. But for Dr. King, this educational moment forced him to deal with students on a different level than he had ever dealt with them before. Now, the Black Power Movement came after um, Carmichael urges uh, the use of the word, but it had been around for a number of years, as I mentioned. It had also been around in terms of economics. The Black community in the segregated South was forced uh, to create for itself uh, a business class. But when James Meredith tries to march across Mississippi, he is shot. To continue that march, Bernard Lee, Dr. King, Stokely Carmichael, and Willie Ricks and others led a contingent across Mississippi. What was split about this march was that Carmichael called for self-defense and fighting back when necessary. Dr. King adhered to nonviolence, and he continued to teach nonviolence. But here were young people who wanted something different. They still loved him and admired him for what he had done, but they began to talk about taking a different approach. Now, for Martin King, that different approach meant a challenge because one of the things that Black Power forced him to do was to think outside of the South. Because in the South, he was revered. And for church folks, his version of nonviolence was revered. But what about in the North? Could you take nonviolence to Chicago and be effective? Could you educate people in nonviolent resistance in Chicago? Now, in the uh, picture on the left, it's part of a freedom festival in Chicago. And if you look really closely, uh, there is the great gospel singer, Mahalia Jackson, who had long been an ally, and she had long been someone who provided solace for Dr. King 
in very tiring moments because his death threats came raining in almost daily. One of the people he called just to, to, to talk to him and sometimes sing was Mahalia Jackson. But Chicago was very dangerous. The photo in the center clearly shows that and the one on the right. And nonviolent protest in Chicago just didn't work like it did in the South. There were too many different obstacles and then there was Mayor Daley. But upheaval continued. In 1967, Detroit and Hartford both suffer riots. The riot in Hartford comes as a result of the purchase of a hot dog. The riot in Detroit, the catalyst is a raid on a blind pig. And so this wave of violence uh, begins to confront Martin King and the SCLC about how do you respond to this wave of violence that begins to sweep the country in many urban areas. Nonviolent education didn't seem to be working. And then there was Vietnam. Dr. King's protest of Vietnam, most scholars say, it became part of his discussion in 1965, and the FBI records clearly show that. But his wife, Coretta, engaged in more Vietnam War protests than he did. Now, he would give his famous speech at Riverside Church on why I opposed the war in Vietnam. It was an issue of human rights, and it was also an issue of economics. When he saw the numbers in terms of what was spent in Vietnam and what was being spent on the war on poverty, in his mind, he knew something was wrong because there was no way the two could coexist, spending on Vietnam and spending on the war on poverty. He also saw something else. He saw that in the Midwest, there were a huge number of farmers who were being paid subsidies, not really to produce anything. And so there was an economic problem. And so he began to educate those who came to hear him on the economics of America, to educate them on human rights. Those changes would be instrumental in him. And much of those changes can be found in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. He wrote the book while on vacation in Ocho Rios, Jamaica in 1967. But poverty, poverty was still hitting the South and many portions of urban America at a huge level even while Vietnam was going on and there were jobs to be had. In 1968, Martin King begins the Poor People's Campaign. This Poor People's Campaign is a human rights campaign. Now, if you're going to educate people on poverty, the best place to do that is Mississippi. Mississippi in 1968 was a poor state in the union, not even close, many people would say. And it still today ranks at the bottom in terms of poverty and in terms of health and other things. But when he visited Mississippi, he visited young families in the Mississippi Delta and some of the poorest regions in the country. And he asked children, what did you have for lunch? They said, pinto beans. He said, what did you have for lunch yesterday? This family of children said, pinto beans. Pinto beans are fine, but it's all you have every day for some families, or in some cases, nothing at all. Now, poverty in Mississippi was apparent, but poverty was also apparent in Memphis, Tennessee when his friend Jim Lawson asked him to come to Memphis to support striking sanitation workers. 
sanitation workers who, in some cases, made enough only to qualify for welfare. They were not allowed to unionize. And so when Lawson invited him there, he decided to come and support them in, in 68, first in March, and then he would come back in April of 1968 to support these striking sanitation workers. There were workers who had also died on the job being uh, crunched and squeezed to death inside of the, um, the back of the, um, the, the uh, trucks where they worked as well. Now, poor people were on the minds of the SCLC. It's also in April of 68, where Dr. King will give his mountaintop speech, his last speech of his life. And a day later, an assassin's bullet will cut him down on April 4th of 1968 at the Lorraine Motel. That death would not bring an end to his message. It would not bring an end to his focus on educating people about what was happening in America. Now, Ralph Abernathy and others decided to continue the Poor People's Campaign on to Washington, D.C. in May and June of 1968, after Dr. King's burial. But his message did not go away. His youngest daughter, Bernice, is a minister. And much of the message that he talked about in terms of the importance of education and what it does allow you to do critically are still told by his, his daughter, Bernice, probably at a level uh, that he would be very, very um, happy to hear. Uh, his son, MLK III, continues a march on Washington every year with some of the resounding same messages that his father was talking about, confronting the economics of poverty, confront, confronting violence in the country. And on January 6th of 2020, the siege at the Capitol for those who are scholars of Dr. King was very reminiscent of what happened to he and a church full of folks in Alabama in 1962. They were inside this church besieged by a mob outside with tear gas flowing. And many people inside thought they were not going to make it out, make it out because the mob at any moment could have gone into the church. But the Alabama governor at that time before George Wallace, he did eventually call out a national force, excuse me, a statewide force to curb the violence and save their lives in 62. But issues of voting rights are still part of the message for the moment. Poverty remains part of that message for the moment. Confronting racism still remains part of that message for the moment. And so do the issues of warfare and both Bernice and MLK III have made those four things part of that message for the moment that they continue. It's also um, during this time, our current time, that Senator Raphael Warnock and Senator John Ossoff have been elected in Georgia. And many of you know, of course, that Raphael Warnock is the pastor of Dr. King's old home church. Ebenezer Baptist Church, a new facility, but but still uh, Ebenezer. And Senator John Ossoff, uh, a young Jewish senator from Georgia, has been elected. Something many people probably never could have imagined. But that message that was laid out in 1955 still remains alive. And as people would say, you could kill a messenger, but you cannot kill the message. And so with that, uh, Steve, Kathleen, I will, I will pause.
And okay, let me you, stop you, sharing. You all, uh, if you have a, anyone who has a question, um, what we've uh, just uh, go ahead and ask it. And that's the best way to, to do this. Okay, I have a question. Uh, first of all, uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, uh, a lot of history in it and a lot of uh, methods in it. <clears throat> and it was interesting before you got to the last slide, I wrote a question down. What's a takeaway for today? Mm -hmm. And you got to the last slide and I'm going, wow, there's so much that is relevant to today. So my question is, what happens tomorrow? Well, what happens tomorrow is that for those who have been part of the struggle, uh, it will continue. Uh, and that's that's part of what um, uh, the Reverend Dr. Bernice um, King says, that things are continual. You know, tomorrow uh, is going to come and you have to continue. Uh, every day um, is a struggle, but some days are more of a joyous struggle than others. But you always maintain that hope. And that's one of the things that their father did. He maintained this tremendous amount of hope. Uh, and he also um, was always trying to educate young people. And one of the things that he did not do, he didn't simply give up on young people because one of the things that Stokely Carmichael and company were saying, uh, they were talking about burning every place down. Uh, they were talking about in some, 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 some ways, um, Representative James Clyburn of, of South Carolina says it's analogous to what, what they experienced. He said that burn baby burn of the 60s, in his opinion, hurt the movement. And he argues that the whole notion of defund the police also hurts the current movement, in his opinion. And so there's some things that you could clearly see that are there. Because I don't I've, I've never heard Dr. King, while he, he criticized public safety, he, he never criticized them to the level that the young people did. He always worked to try to get them to see his side. And he was willing to listen to them no matter what. Um, and he never gave up on them. Because when, when SNCC first started, he was told by leaders his age and those who were slightly older than him, just co-opt the students and make them part of SCLC. And he said, no, young people, as you point out, they are tomorrow. So they have to have their own message. And so he said, let them have their own organization. They have to have their own message. And so that was the beauty of what he did. Um, and he, and most people listened to him because he was, um, as my students would say, he was the man. And so they kind of, whatever he said, they kind of knew, okay, he's the guy. You know, you can't really say too much to him. You know, he's, I mean, he was, he was the guy. Obviously, John Lewis listened to him. Yeah, John Lewis was, um, actually, I think John Lewis actually wrote to him when he was a teenager, uh, he says. Um, I actually got to meet John Lewis when I interned in Washington, D.C. And he talked a little bit about uh, his time with, um, with Dr. King and what it was like to, to meet him uh, and listen to him. And he was... Dr. King was his hero. Uh, and the same could be said for um, the Reverend Dr. Joe Lowry. Because uh, Lowry said that Dr. King would always allow them, no matter who they were, to argue among themselves first. He would let them argue for two or three hours. And he would always ask them if they were done. And then he would always find a way to pull them back together. Uh, no matter what the discussion was, if it was talking about uh, how to educate voters in the Sea Islands of, of uh, South Carolina and Georgia, he found a way 
to get them to, to talk to each other once they finish yelling. I guess that's the best way to put it. Reading Dr. King's books when I was about 15 mm -hmm. and being overwhelmed with admiration for him. When I was 17, Selma happened and I remember mm -hmm. crying. I also remember Stokely Carmichael, and there's one thing that I can't forgive him for, and that's when he said the only place for women in SNCC yep. is prone. Prone, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. He, he he said that actually more than one time too. It wasn't it wasn't anything that was just a one time thing for him. Um, but the the funny thing about that is that most of the people doing the day doing the day to day work for SNCC were women. And if you ever see any pictures, most of the people protesting are young women, um, massive dumpers. Uh, and you, you're actually seeing some changes now, um, particularly in, in, in Southern states where um, young women are now at the forefront and who are very, very talented uh, because Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff would not have been elected were it not for the women who organized the Democratic Party in Georgia. Uh, I mean, they were, they were amazing. Um, my, my sisters and my relatives in Georgia, they were touched in some way by Stacey Abrams and Latasha Brown and all those politicians yeah. who organized people. They said they got out everywhere. They called everybody. And when you go knocking on doors where I grew up, you got some courage uh, because it's way out in the boonies. Um, and I'm thinking, because when I grew up, we actually, I don't, no, I don't think there was a sign or something saying what road it was. It was like, it was like a route, 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 something. And I, don't, I don't remember what route it was, but there was no sign. I think it was just like route 396. And so you just had to know where you were going. But they knocked on all those doors, which is very important. Yes. Go ahead, Kathy. Um, your your talk was wonderful. Um, I mean, there were things I you can always learn, but there were new things that I learned from from the history. But uh, I think were you talking about Tim Scott a minute ago from South Carolina? No, I was talking about James Clyburn, oh, Representative okay. James Clyburn, not not Senator Tim Scott. James Clyburn. Um, I'm trying to think. Is Clyburn? I can't remember if he represents uh, Charleston or not. But he's been in in Congress for a number of years. He was the uh, representative. Uh, he's mm -hmm. a representative who has his big fish fry every year in South Carolina. And if you wanna, if you wanna do anything politically, and you're a Democrat in South Carolina, a Democrat anywhere. And you want to do anything in South Carolina, you got to go see James Clyburn. Uh, because if you don't come to his fish fry, you're in big trouble. You won't get any votes. Um, so. I, had, I had real trouble with Tim Scott uh, talk after Biden. Uh -huh. but, he it, but he got a lot of praise for it. And well, he got, a, he got a lot of praise in some circles. Um, most of the... Um, most of the young people I talked to didn't like it very well um, um, because they say that what they are experiencing is not what he was talking about. Yeah. So it's just it's just it's it's a, it's a different different thing. Um, how, how did he and Clyburn get along? I think they, they I think they have met, but I don't think they um, they vote too much alike. They've gotten along, but I don't think they vote too much alike at all. Mm -hmm. um, Tim Tim Scott has stepped out, they say, and brought forth a measure uh, on police reform. But I don't think a lot of people, at least on the Democratic side, think it's, it goes far enough. Uh, particularly if you talk to young people, they say it doesn't go far enough in terms of accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't hold specific officers accountable. Um, I think it might hold 
police departments accountable, but not particular officers accountable. And most young people now who are very progressive, they aren't, they aren't going to go for that. So I was struck um, in your presentation uh, by the number of women, particularly in the South, mm -hmm. who continually came up with more and more people, and you just went through it without any particular special comment about them being women. And I wonder if this was at that time during the uh, uh, 50s and 60s, whether this was peculiar to the South or how important the women were. Um, because usually you think of the ministers who were almost entirely male that you knew about that was mm -hmm. going on. And these women of various sorts seem to be in critical leadership roles. That That is true. Uh, because even after um, Ella Baker left the SCLC, Dorothy Cotton uh, ran the SCLC on the, uh, on the, on the day to day. Uh, when you talked about voter education in the Sea Islands, uh, key to that was Septima Clark. When you talked about the NAACP in the 50s in Arkansas, it was pretty much run by Daisy Bates. Everybody knows at the state level how things are. And even if you go back to Connecticut and the founding of the NAACP in Connecticut, uh, it's actually... Um, women who really found the NAACP in Connecticut. Uh, in fact, um, the Hartford NAACP is founded by Mary Townsend Seymour. Now, she wasn't the first president. Um, a man was the first president, but she was the second president. But she organized everything. And the same is true for portions of um, New Haven now. And I think if my memory doesn't fail me, um, most of the uh, presidents of NAACP chapters in Connecticut now are women. Uh, I think the vast majority are women. And, I could, uh, if I could jump in. Sure. Uh, I'm going back to the beginning of your presentation when mm -hmm. you were talking about education and the value of education for making people more intelligent and uh, analytical and able to think as well as instilling values in character. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, you know, theoretically, at least, we're one of the most educated countries in the world. Um, but we don't seem to fit that mold. I mean, a third of the population, I would not describe as intelligent and uh, able to think and make decisions and not be fooled uh, mm -hmm. and have good morals and good values and good character. So either... Um, we're not we're not as educated as I think, or the education is not seeping into the ground. What's your well, reaction to that? Well, what 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 Dr. King was talking about was, in a sense, book education, but it's not all that he was talking about, uh, because I'll give you an example of the uh, the voter education along the the Sea Islands. Before Septima Clark came along, they had attempted to educate black men and women who worked in the fields on how to register to vote for years, how to do that. And what they would do, surprisingly enough, they would, the people who wanted to do that, they would, they would bring in these adults who could not read or write into a um, first grade classroom. Now, if you've all ever been in a first grade classroom, you know they have these little tiny desks and you would have these adult men and women sitting at these little tiny desks and they would say, okay, we're gonna teach you your ABCs in the 1960s. And Septima Clark saw that and she said, that's ridiculous. You cannot teach adult people how to read and write, making them sit in these little tiny desks, and we're gonna teach you your ABCs. She said, you'll never get them to the point where they can register to vote that way. 
So she began to use newspapers and magazines to show, get them to the point where they could recognize words, to get them to the point where they could learn on a more adult level. And they also used the Bible as well in portions of South Carolina and Georgia. And her method worked. What they were talking about was common sense education because there were a lot of people who had common sense education. And they began to get people to think about common sense things. Because if you are working and paying your taxes, common sense says you should have the right to vote. And you should not be denied the right to vote. So if you could get people, educate people to overcome their fear, then they could make that challenge. And that's in part, that was part of the process because Martin King had to, he had to get used to overcoming his fear as well because his wife Coretta said in that 55 to 56 period, they got something like 55 death threats every day that she could count. And so you gotta be, you got to educate and foment up yourself to deal with that. And that takes a lot. So. Are there any other questions? If not, Dr. Close, thank you very, very much. That was wonderful. This is all been going to you. And, and please invite me back again where I can come and stand and talk to you. Yep, that's going like to happen. Right, Kathy? Long time. You could probably tell. I did know that. <laughs> okay. Kathy, you're much. muted. We're going to put you in our list of winter speakers. We want fantastic. you back. Winter all right. 2022. All right. Sounds fantastic. And thank you all again and have a wonderful day. It looks like it's going to be warm out, so we can all get outside after work here. Okay. Well, you have 15 minutes before your next presentation. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll scoot over to the building there and make the presentation for them. Thank okay. you, everybody. And All goodbye. Right. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.